Now, I want to use this course section to simply summarize what we learned and give you basically a checklist for all the rules and concepts we covered throughout this course, which you can use to, well, keep these things in mind and follow these rules. Though I also want to emphasize again that you shouldn't really treat it as a checklist. At least always question all these rules and concepts because, as for example with the functions, you want to split functions reasonably. You don't want to overdo it. These are guidelines and recommendations, not hard rules which you have to follow. Because the most important rule, which you always should keep in mind, is that when we talk about clean code, we talk about code which is easy to read and understand by humans. This matters. We're talking about humans here. We're not talking about the computer understanding your code. It should be easy to read and understand for humans. And if your code is easy to read and understand, then it's clean. Or it's probably easy to read and understand because you wrote it in a clean way to be precise. And there are certain key areas and key rules and concepts which you can follow to achieve that clean code. And that would for example be the naming of things, naming of variables and functions and classes and so on, comments and formatting, functions, working with control structures correctly, and working with classes and objects correctly. These are the areas we covered in this course. And now let's take a closer look again at all these areas and let me summarize what matters for these specific areas and which general rules you should follow there. Now let's start with naming. There it all starts with descriptive names. Describe which data you're storing in a variable or which task a function is going to execute. Therefore, typically use nouns for variables and properties or short phrases with adjectives. Use nouns for classes and verbs for methods or just as for the variables and properties, use short phrases. Be specific and be as specific as possible, but don't be redundant. So for example, you might name a variable SQL database instead of just database, but you shouldn't come up with super long variable names, which take up the entire screen width. And definitely avoid slang, unknown abbreviations, and be consistent with your names. Don't switch between get data and fetch data, be consistent. And if you follow these rules, and of course, that's just a summary of what I taught in the naming module. If you follow these rules, you should end up with names that are easy to read, which is an important part of writing clean code. Comments and formatting. That's another important area. There you should keep in mind that most comments are bad and you should therefore avoid them. Now, feel free to add the good comments you learned about, like legal information, warnings, required explanations, for example, for regular expressions, and to-dos. When it comes to formatting, use vertical formatting to keep related concepts together and to separate concepts which are not closely related. And when I say together or separate, I'm talking about things like adding or not adding blank lines and line breaks, and also about ordering. A function should, for example, come before the function which it calls, if technically possible. Now, when we talk about horizontal formatting, you want to keep lines short and add line breaks and split code across multiple lines to keep it easy to read and understand. Also use indentation to express relations between block statements and the code inside of them. And of course also keep language specific style guides like the PAP8 style guide for Python in mind. Also use IDE auto formatting and help the IDE can give you in general when it comes to generating and writing clean code. This is all in addition to what you learned in this course which did not focus on a specific programming language. Now, functions are the meat of most programs. That's where the majority of your logic resides. And therefore, it's key to write clean functions. That all starts with the parameters. Limit the number of function parameters and try to keep the list short. 
Consider using dictionaries or objects to group multiple parameters into one parameter and therefore make sure that functions are easy to call and the code where a function does get called is easy to read and understand. Now when we talk about the function body, clean functions should be small functions that do just one thing. Now you learned that this one thing is related to the levels of abstraction. So therefore always make sure that there is no big gap between the level of abstraction implied by a function name and the actual code which can be found in the function and that you're not mixing multiple levels of abstraction in one function. Also, of course, don't repeat yourself. That should be obvious, but it is important. And avoid unexpected side effects. Side effects are okay, but if they're unexpected, then a function is not easy to understand and therefore it's not written in a clean way. Now often you're also going to use control structures. And there one suggestion is that you're using positive wording, if possible and if it makes sense. And of course avoid deep nesting. For example, by using these guards, these if checks at the beginning of a function, which cancel the function execution early if some condition is not met. Or avoid deep nesting by extracting logic and control structures into separate functions. That is always something which matters. Consider using polymorphism and factory functions to avoid code duplication, just as I showed it to you throughout this course and use real errors instead of synthetic errors replicated with if statements. This also is a key part of writing clean code. Now often you're also going to work with objects. Of course, especially when using an object-oriented programming style. You should be able to differentiate between real objects and objects which only hold some data. You could call these objects data structures or data containers. Depending on what you need, it's okay to use either of these two kinds of objects, but you should not mix them. Either have real objects with an API of methods which are exposed, or just use data containers. Mixing them often results in unclean code. Clean classes also should be small, and you achieve that by focusing on one responsibility. Which does not mean that a class should only have one method. That's important and I did explain this in greater detail in the classes and objects module. Also follow the law of Demeter when working with real objects since that ensures that you're not diving too deeply into objects and their API and the API of only loosely related objects which often leads to code which would be hard to understand and hard to maintain. And speaking of maintainability especially when using an object-oriented programming style, you should follow the solid principles. Now there, especially the SRP and OCP matter, as I explained in the classes and objects module, but if you follow these principles in general, you also often will end up with cleaner code automatically. Because these principles do not just enforce maintainability, but they also often lead to cleaner code because they make the code easier to understand. And these are the main things, the main rules and concepts you should keep in mind. You also find this checklist, which you should really put between quotes, because it's not really a checklist as explained, but you do find it attached. And you also find a PDF document with a checklist, which you could actually use as a checklist if you wanted to. And therefore, you now have all the different core rules and concepts, which you should always keep in mind, when you want to focus on writing clean code. This course section is about staying clean. I want to ensure that you're really able to apply what you learned and that you can take the next step and write better code than you maybe did before. And for that, the most important rule, which you must not forget, clean code is equal to readable and understandable code. Whatever helps this goal, so whenever you do something which improves readability and understandability, it makes your code cleaner. This is really important to keep in mind. It's not about checking 10 different rules which you apply to your code. It is about writing readable and understandable code. That is the ultimate goal. Don't forget this.
Also don't forget that whilst we didn't focus on a specific programming paradigm or style or language in this course, the rules and concepts taught in this course will always apply. You always want to have readable and meaningful names. You always want to have slim, concise and clean functions. And you always want to have an understandable control flow and no nested if statements. So this all always applies. Now, this course didn't focus on a specific programming paradigm, like object-oriented programming. Instead, what you learned, as I just mentioned, will always apply. Nonetheless, of course, also keep paradigm-specific or programming language-specific conventions, style guides and rules in mind, and apply them in combination with what you learned here. For Python, for example, follow the PEP8 style guide so that you follow all the common best practices for the specific language and style you use. And then, in addition, of course, apply what you learned here to ensure that you're not just following some style guide, but that you do everything to write clean code. Also keep in mind what I said in the first course section about clean code and patterns and principles. Not all patterns and principles help you with clean code. I mean, they will always help to some extent, but often they focus on giving you a clean architecture or on keeping your code extensible and maintainable. And that of course is important, don't get me wrong. But for clean code, there are more important principles and less important principles. And I had a look at some of the most important principles throughout this course. So always also keep that in mind. Of course you want to follow all the best practices and principles for your given programming language or framework, but for clean code, also always keep in mind that not all principles will automatically give you clean code. This is important because it's easy to write bad code even though you follow all these principles. Now what would be next steps? In this course we focused on clean code. And I mentioned in course section 1 that there also is something called clean architecture. This could be something you want to dive in next, but this will then depend on which programming paradigm you're following, if you are doing object-oriented programming, for example, and it will depend on the programming language you chose. There, you can then dive into some conventions, patterns and ideas to organize your code and your project such that it is very extensible and maintainable and that you have such a clean architecture, where you, for example, separate your database access logic from your view logic or anything like that. This could be something which is interesting as well, in addition to knowing all these clean code rules covered in this course. Another possible next step or an area you could consider diving in deeper would be testing and test-driven development. In this course, I did not focus on testing or test-driven development at all, just as mentioned in course section 1. I did of course show that testing does help with writing clean code though. In the functions section, I showed that you can determine when to split your functions or at least get some help there when you do write tests. Because it turns out that functions which are written in a clean way and do just one thing are easier to test. So therefore, diving deeper into testing and maybe even test-driven development could also be something you want to do as a next step. And you could also argue that having a, a suite of working tests and that you're testing everything your application does is a part of having a clean code base overall. Now it doesn't directly affect your code, or at least only to some extent, as mentioned in the functions section, but of course tests have one advantage. If I read a test, I also understand what a certain function or a certain part of your code should do and how it should be used. And that's why tests also could help with readability. Now, testing, of course, is generally always the same, but how you write and run your tests then depends on the programming language you used, and it therefore was not the focus of this course. Nonetheless, as a next step, diving deeper into testing and test-driven development is definitely something you should consider.